So this lecture is going to be fun. Life is too, far too short to waste it being dignified. Feel free to interrupt me at any point. I won't be offended by anything. Um, during this lecture, I'm going to be jumping through a number of real-world vulnerabilities in embedded systems. Uh, to prevent the chicken little world is ending thing, I'm not going to um, do these on meter vendors themselves, but I will do it on their suppliers. Um, my reasoning being that no one is going to freak out if they know that Texas Instruments has a vulnerability. Uh, but ITRON and Elster and the rest of them don't have the same luxury. Um, and uh, throughout this, I'm going to try and convince you to start taking apart the things that your firms are purchasing. So if you buy a meter, take a screwdriver to it, open it up, poke around, start Googling the part numbers that you see on the chips inside of it. And very quickly, you'll start learning things about these devices that you wouldn't imagine you could find. Um, and you'll start recognizing design similarities between different devices. Uh, in particular, the radio boards are very similar between different brands of meters because the radio chip designers give them free la radio layout designs to copy. Um, and so, of course, it's the smart meters that you all care about, uh, but realize that these meters are made with the same techniques and by the same engineers that design other products. So every vulnerability that I show you in a toy or a keyboard or a garage door uh, quite likely has an analog or an identical vulnerability within meter hardware. Um, so that's the boring stuff. Also, I only have 30 minutes. So I, in order to hit as many vulnerabilities as I can, I will at times have to skip over the technical details of exactly how they function. If I fail to describe anything to your satisfaction, you can find the complete article on my blog. Uh, and if you have trouble finding anything, you can email me and I'll point you toward the original sources. Um, I'm also going to be doing this lecture with uh, pictures on the projector in order to allow me to speak my way through it so that you don't spend an hour reading slides that you could have read afterward. Uh, it's, it's a terrible way to go. Um, the first section of this will be on a carburetor and a knitting machine. Um, I actually went to high school about a half hour east of here, and I, before I dropped out to go to college, I was in automotive mechanics. And when I dropped out, they actually gave me a diploma majoring in automotive mechanics. I'm not authorized by the state of Tennessee to go to college. And luckily, no one pays attention to that. Um, but in my third and final year, I was the only student in both uh, the most advanced math class and the most advanced auto tech class. And I was a smart ass. So I asked my uh, instructor, uh, Coach Krigger, I asked him a question about how a carburetor works in fancy math terms. And when a student does this, there's, uh, there are a number of different replies that could be done. Uh, first, he could have made up an excuse and moved on. Second, he could have admitted that he didn't understand the question or he could have called me out uh, for being a jerk by asking this question or a number of other things. Instead, he left the room uh, for 15 minutes without explanation. Um, he, by the time he came back in, of course, the entire classroom had devolved into chaos. And he walks in with a carburetor and a screwdriver and he slams them both down on my table, uh, looks at me and says, figure it out for your own damn self. <laughs> And that was the best lesson that I got in all of school up to that point. Um, so for the first section uh, when discussing this knitting machine, I'm just going to show you how to, tell, how to take things apart. Um, this section has nothing malicious in it. It's after that that we get back to vulnerabilities in devices and how understanding how the device behaves in order to make it a, behave in a different way is really the same, whether you're trying to add a feature or get free electricity. Um, so here on the right, this is a knitting machine that I purchased in North Holland in November. Um, on the left, you can see the fabric coming out of the machine, and it's done as a repeating pattern. So you have, in this case, a dinosaur with a banjo. All dinosaurs should have banjos. 
And it, every time you swipe the uh, head across, it switches which uh, yarns are in front and which ones are in back. And that way, it's able to produce an image. So two friends and I took this apart, and we reverse engineered the entire damn thing. Uh, we've looked, got a firmware dump. We uh, reverse engineered the keyboard in uh, here, each one of these, like the start button, that's in row four, column one. And if you take row four as a wire, and you take column one as a wire, and you just touch those two wires together, that's the same as pushing the start button. And when you physically press it, that's all that it's doing. It's connecting one row to one column. So knowing the rows and columns, it's possible to break them out. Uh, these two ribbon cables actually contain here are the rows and there are the columns. And they go out to this board on the bottom right, which was thrown together in a few hours as a keyboard emulator. This is then wired into the back of the machine. And up here, just out of view of the camera, that's a floppy disk emulator that I built. So having these two, I am now able to automate the pressing of buttons on this device's keyboard. And I'm also able to emulate the contents of its floppy disk which is enough to order it to load a new pattern from the disk automatically. This is now part of an art museum at Mediumatic Bank on Vajlstraat in Amsterdam. And the way that the exhibit works is that you take your RFID tag, it's a MyFair Classic, any MyFair Classic will do, you can use your Dutch Metro card, you can even use some American ones, and you tap it right there where there's a reader. Having tapped it, you then draw an avatar for yourself, which you will use to play multi-threaded banjo dinosaur knitting adventure 2D Extreme. <laughs> um, the game itself is here on the left. And then on the right, the high score list is actually knit as a tapestry that feeds out of the machine. And this is more than 300 yards long by now. Um, so a sample square looks like this. And it certifies that I beat Ayan Skype Nissa on uh, that date and time. Uh, and it was possible to do this without using any particularly advanced technology. I didn't have to build a knitting machine from scratch. I didn't have to build an RFID reader from scratch because all of these components were around and could be reassembled. And because almost all keypads work in the same way. So because of this, everything should be taken apart because the more things you take apart, the more you know, uh, the more you notice similarities in the designs. Uh, for example, you can take apart microchips by using white fuming nitric acid to strip off the packaging and then a bit, of fuming a bit of sulfuric acid to remove the gunk that's left behind. You can then take a metallurgical, a metallurgical microscope and take dozens of photographs of the dye and stitch them together with the same panorama software that you would use to assemble uh, panoramas from family vacation photos. Um, so this is my French Metro card, uh, Le Navigo de Couvert. And normally this, these have photo IDs on them. The, the French rule is that you can get ones without them, but then you're required to carry state ID as well in order to use the card. Um, inside of the card, like if it, right here, I think, there is a chip. And you can find the chip by taking a pen knife to the outside of the plastic. And then you peel it off. And this little rectangle is the computer that does whatever the card does. It handles all RFID communication with the outside world. It does all of the cryptography. And inside of it, there is a computer program. This is what the chip looks like. This was assembled from, I think, 800 photos. And in total, it's 100 megapixels. You can zoom in far enough to see individual design elements. Um, Right there, there's a frog, and over here somewhere, there's a snail. Uh, this art is thrown in by the designer as a sort of joke, you know, and as a good luck measure. Because if you don't have chip art on the chip, it might not work. <laughs> yeah. Um, somewhere there's a man taking all of the magic smoke in the world, and he's bottling it up and then squirting it into the chips. Uh, this is a frog. From this frog, you can tell that the chip was made by ST Microelectronics. Because these same markings that function as harmless art can also be used to identify chips which do not have identification tags in them. Um, this is the Ember 357 chip. 
that they recently came out with to replace their 200 series. And 357, the first thing that you think of is a 357 Magnum. Um, you can find other things while looking at these photographs. And again, we've, up to this point, there's been no usage of an electron microscope, nothing that you couldn't purchase on eBay for a thousand bucks or so. Uh, this is the MSP430 F2274. And right there is a masked ROM. This is a photograph of it at full magnification. And it, each one of these columns is a bit of significance. And then within that, you've got these little row pairs of dots. And you'll note that some of the dots are there and some of them aren't. Wherever there's a dot, that's a one. Wherever there's no dot, there's a zero. If you have the patience to go through this picture and mark each bit on a piece of graph paper, and then figure out where the rows and columns go, you can actually read this computer program. The program itself is a bootloader, which allows you to program the chip through a serial port. Or if there's already programming inside of it, you can use this program to erase the flash memory and then write a new one in. And it's not supposed to allow you to read the old programming out unless you can prove that you know uh, a little piece of the code as a password. There's a timing vulnerability in this masked ROM, which allows the uh, bytes to be compared one at a time instead of all at once. So you can play Jeopardy with it then. Does it begin with an A? Does it begin with a B? Does it begin with a C? Counting all the way upward for each byte, one at a time until you get to the end. The end result being that it, instead of taking hundreds of years to brute force this password, it can be done in a couple of minutes. And because this is in mass ROM, because it is physically right there, and it is physically written at the factory, you can't erase it. You can't disable it. Every device that's shipped with the vulnerable version of this program is in a device that exposes its firmware to anyone who knows how to ask. And this isn't specific to, say, a Microsoft product, a mouse or whatever that contains it. It's not specific to any particular brand of meter. It is specific to everyone who has ever purchased and installed this chip in their product. And that's a hell of a lot of different products, none of which are easy to identify from a customer standpoint. You don't know if any part of your infrastructure depends upon this chip, unless you've taken it apart and you have Googled the part numbers and you know exactly what the thing that you're using was bought with, or was built with. So in everything that you have, take it apart. Uh, circuit boards. You can recover the design of a two-layer circuit board by heating it up until the solder melts, brushing the parts off, and running it through a flatbed scanner. You can buy a bus analyzer for a few hundred dollars that by hooking it up to syringes and poking those syringes into a circuit board, you can get the AES keys as they are sent from the microcontroller to the radio. And these chips are used by both smart meters and toys. So you don't necessarily have to find anything uh, expensive or sold only in very large quantities. You don't have to deal with any of those supply issues. You can just buy a toy. And wire a debugger into it and write new software into it and figure out how that toy functions and in that way, understand how these things are built. Um, this is a development kit called the Telos B, or T-Mote Sky. It's sold under both brand names. It was designed by UC Berkeley as wireless sensor networking uh, equipment in 2004. And the nifty thing about this is that the, the microcontroller is on the underside of the board. This is the radio. It's a Chipcon 2420. Uh, these three points are the serial bus. One of them has data going from the microcontroller to the radio. The other has data going in the opposite direction. And the third one is a clock that tells each when to speak and when to listen. If you tap the line that's going into the radio and also the clock, and then you hit the reset button, on any software for this device that uses the AES mode of the 802.15.4 radio, you will see the key go across as it's loaded into the radio. 
And you can sniff that key as it's going across and then use it to sniff all future traffic in the clear.